This is Still a Part of Us, a podcast where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter Red, and in this episode of Advice and Encouragement from a Lost Mom, I chat with Caitlin, whose daughter, Vanessa, was stillborn at 37 weeks and six days due to a placental abruption. By the way, you can hear Caitlin's and her husband Alphonse's episode about the birth of their child on episodes 37 and 39. Today we discuss with Caitlin how a fellow lost mom validated all her feelings and told her that the pain never leaves you, but days get easier. How she was recommended by her therapist to feel all her feelings and grieve for short amounts of time regularly, then to move forward with her day. And that her friends are sad and mourning for them and their loss of Vanessa too. As a word of caution to our listeners, this discussion contains emotional triggers of stillbirth and infant loss. Please keep yourself emotionally and mentally healthy and seek help if needed. Hope this helps someone out there. Caitlin, thank you again for coming on to the podcast today and to sh- and sharing Vanessa's story with us. It was so beautiful and I'm grateful for um, that little bit of joy that she brought to your life and, and it's probably still bringing to your life, even though there's a lot of sadness, of course, but I'm sure there's quite a bit of joy that she brings to your life. So thank you again for coming on to the podcast and welcome. Thank you. And, it, you know, you're right. It, she brings so much love to my life. But at the same time, there's so much sadness that's brought in. But I always like to try and remember that, you know, my love for her is never going to go away. And my grief for her is never going to go away. So I can love and grieve her. Yeah. If you have um, a chance, please listen to Vanessa's birth story. It's so lovely. And I, it just reminds me of how wonderful people that are around you, (laughs) they take such good care of you. It's kind of cool to to hear your story. So um, as for context, how long ago was Vanessa born so that we know where you are in the grief process? Yeah. So it's been about four months and a week since she was born. Yeah. And so you're still so, so new to this. Uh, yes, it's a very new process. <laughs> how has the, the last four months looked for you? The first month was really rough. I cried a lot. It was a struggle to be a parent after losing her because my son still had school Monday through Friday, so I still had to get up at 5.30 every morning, get him ready, get him to school. But thankfully, we had family there with us for the first almost month after she had passed there with us. So we, we never had an empty house. Yeah. Um, if we did have an empty house, it was never more than for a few hours. We, you know, someone left, we're like, we need someone else over here. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that really helped us. Yeah. Those first few months are just rough. (laughs) That's all I can say. It's just rough. So, and, but it does help when you have family around. Yeah. So it really does. Yeah. The the holidays were a bit rough too. Um, we're huge Halloween people. Oh really? And And that was right before, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Oh yeah, it really was. And we, um, when we went trick or treating, we had a little pumpkin outfit picked out for her. Mm. And, um, one thing I, I haven't mentioned yet is right when I had my selective 3d scans done, I, I bought a little penguin and in it has a recording of her heartbeat. Oh, really? And yeah. And so I brought that penguin with her urn in it. Um, and I, I kind of wrapped the urn up in um, the costume, like with a hair tie and everything. So you kind of see it through. And I carried that penguin and everything around with me because I was dressed up as a pumpkin and her, um, my husband was dressed in a pumpkin suit. So we were like a pumpkin patch together. <laughs> Cute. And that was our plan. Um, so, you know, we did that and my son decided to be a cow. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it was fun. And that's kind of how we did the first holiday. And it was, it was hard. But I would have to say that Christmas was the hardest, you know, because I didn't get, you know, and you're not setting out a stocking for her. You're not putting presents out for her. And like, yeah, I could put ornaments up and everything, but there's so much missing underneath the tree and so much missing in the house. And, um, so that that was definitely hard. Um, I think New Year's was the worst. Really? Because I felt like leaving 2019 was leaving her behind. Oh. oh. And 
I didn't, I don't know why I thought of it that way, but it felt like with the new year that she was just left behind in there, Mm. you know, and it was a year she would never see. That was pretty hard for me. But when New Year's and everything came and gone, I was like, okay, I made it. I survived. But I I remember a couple of days leading up just having that feeling and, um, and I, I, I kind of got myself over it because I told myself, you know, she's not being left there. I'm bringing her with me. You know, she's never left behind. She's never just, she's never just going to be stuck to the day that she was born. You know, she's always with me and she's, she will never leave my side. That's beautiful. I agree that yeah, they will never leave you behind. So that's great. Yeah. I that's that's a good way of looking at it. Because I was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Like leave you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you what do you try to do for yourself so that to allow yourself to to grieve? Do you allow um, yourself to grieve? <laughs> yeah. At first, it was I would kind of block out my emotions because it's just so intense to feel so intense. And so then eventually I was like, you know, I need to do something good for myself. So when I started seeing my therapist and everything, um, they encouraged me to acknowledge my feelings, tell myself it's okay, feel it for like maybe an hour and then say, okay, I'm done and move on with the day. Because if I were to just sit there and feel it all day, it would be so draining and I probably wouldn't really move too much forward in my grief and being a parent and being a good wife, it would be a little harder, you know, for me to do all of that if I just let the floodgates down, you know, it was kind of like releasing a little bit of pressure each time. Gotcha. And that, that has really helped me manage my grief. Um, without feeling like I'm sinking into a dark hole. Yeah. I like that. Cause so there are days when you're like, it could be the floodgates, but uh, mm-hmm. the idea of just where's Noah's some... Ark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I don't have a boat built. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But then also just relieving some pressure here and there. I think that yeah. helps. So it doesn't <laughs> blow up in your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, re- it really does help. And have you found besides this, uh, just like giving yourself an hour to, to mourn anything else that has helped you as you've gone through this, how, how that has helped you heal. Once again, um, I, I realize you are still very early yeah. in this grieving process, but I'm sure you found some things along the way. Yeah. So really it's talking about her, um, being open with, the, uh, our friends and, um, our friends allowing us to share the grief or even our friends sharing their grief with us has been a tremendous help because it helps me realize that I wasn't the only one that loved Vanessa and I'm not the only person or our family aren't the only people who are affected by her death. And, you know, it's, it's friends who we're close with. It's, you know, it coworkers that, you know, you work with and, um, have remained friends with it's so it's so many so many things you know it's being able to share in that and have that around you and I'm I've been so fortunate to have people in my life that are willing to surround me instead of doing the whole oh give space and you know making me feel isolated that's really commendable about your friends and I, I think you bring up something that I've never thought of before, but you're right. There's a lot of people that are grieving for your baby as well as for you um, that are not immediate family. Um, I yeah. have several friends that I it comes to mind and I know they have wept many tears for, for us and for for our baby. And so I that's so cool that your friends are so they're with you. They're they're with you. Yeah. They um They've been awesome, you know, and another thing I would have to say is not like for me what I've done, but has been a help to me has been that one of my friends, she said she had a dream about Vanessa and she shared that with me. She said she had the dream that I was at her house and I was sitting on the couch and I had her in my arms and, you know, we were like, we were just glowing and everything was perfect. And she said, you know, I woke up and 
she was like, it made me so sad that I don't get to see that, you know? And, um, but she has, you know, she has been phenomenal. She, you know, her and I've really grown close in my grief and she's, you know, she shares her grief with me and she is sometimes like, you know, I still tell my husband, I can't believe Vanessa's gone. You know, I can't, it's hard for me still to understand that this is a reality. And I said, yeah, me too, girl. Me too. (laughs) I get where you're coming from. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Oh, it's, it's one of those things. Yeah. Do you have any um, special things that you, you mentioned her urn, which is in the shape of a heart. Mm -hmm. And do you have any other things that you remember her by that are a physical something that like a special object that you use to remember her by? I use the penguin that has her heartbeat in it. Yeah, which is so cute. And and I have a little table for her that is in our foyer. So she's always in our gathering area. Oh. And I have it set up with a what I what I like to call it is a forever bouquet. I bought like those really beautiful wax flowers from Michaels. Mm-hmm. Um, I got marigolds because those are her birth flower. And I made a beautiful arrangement of that, as well as some of the flowers that I used in my wedding bouquet, actually. And my great grandmother did an oil painting of her, of her in my arms. Um, one of the photos I was actually, you know, taken. And um, so she did that for me. We have the headband that was on her that's wrapped around a little, uh, one of Alfonso's old little stuffed horses when he was little on Uh the table. (laughs) And I have a little uh, jar that you can write notes and put in there to write notes to her. Oh, that is really sweet. Yeah, I have have all that there. There's some angel wings with her birthday and her name and, you know, how much she weighed and everything. And I have her footprints there, too. So I have, I have, I have Vanessa's spot in my house. Yeah. Um, I also have two necklaces for her. One actually has a photo that's kind of like that 3D hologram Mm -hmm. in it. It's in a heart. Another one uh, that was made by my mother-in-law. Another one, my sister-in-law and brother made, and it has her name in it. It has the pink and blue ribbon for the, hauntingly enough, the month of October, the infant loss and infertility month. Yep. And it has angel wings and it has her birth date on it. And so I have those things that I wear all the time. I alternate between the two, depending on the outfit, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I have those to keep, to help keep her close and remember her by. And um, I, I've even had random people from the community or people online on Reddit that have sent us books and trinkets and things like that you know because they've also suffered the loss and they wanted to give us a little something so I have that on the on her table too wow it's amazing how yeah this community is some of the like I've met the nicest most wonderful caring people Mm -hmm. from this community Mm -hmm. the one club that you don't want to be a part of right it's very true you you know you you see the it's one of those clubs that you see and you don't want to envy it when you're on the outside. Mm-hmm. You just, you know, it's something that you don't want. Yeah. And I wouldn't wish this on the worst person in the world. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's awful. We were talking earlier before we started that you do go to a grief support group um, I do. in your local area. And I think you mm-hmm. actually know one of our previous um, interviewees. Um, I do. Emily um, from that. Yes. Emily and Dustin. And so, I'll put a link in the show notes for their interviews because they were great. And has that helped you? Has that has going to those grief support groups been helpful to you? Oh, it absolutely has. It's been helpful because I can cry for Vanessa. I can cry for other people's babies. I've met wonderful people through there. And, you know, we've made uh, connections and friendships through it. It's been a sanctuary, really, to be able to go in and say, well, like, something absurd, like, um, you know, you go, um, one of the times I went in and I said, you know, beforehand, I used to go into the baby section and on the baby diaper things, you see all the babies. I'm like, look how cute the babies are. And now I go in and I'm like, that baby's really not that cute. <laughs> and I was like, it, because I'm like, well, mine's better. Yeah. But I'm like, I've never thought that before. And I was like, and I asked, like, am I crazy? I'm like, nope, I think the same thing now. <laughs> and it's so liberating to know that 
even though I have like, like, I, I wouldn't consider that one of my nicest thoughts, you know, because I'm like, I shouldn't think that. But it was just one of those irrational thoughts that just come to mind. And, yeah. and then you're just like, later, like, oh, okay, like, maybe I was being a little harsh there. But <laughs> um, to know that someone's like, yeah, I totally thought that. Yeah. And when my friends share pictures on Facebook, I'm like, okay, great. It's, it's the baby. You know, yeah. <laughs> you like you don't have the same, you don't have the same reaction, not because you don't want to be happy for them. But because it's so hard to push aside the grief and be happy, even mm-hmm. though you can be both at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think because I'm so early in my grief that the grief will take more than the happiness will. Mm-hmm. But it, it's like, regardless, like, happy for you, great, but I, I can't do it right now. Mm-hmm. You know, and setting those boundaries with them telling the friends that's like, you know, I'll still talk to them. That's fine. But don't invite me on a play date. <laughs> Not going to happen. Yep. Yeah. I, um, you know, my friend that I became close with the other day, uh, she had a baby shower and I went because I love her to death Yeah, and I want to be there for her son. And I'm excited. I'm over the moon for her. I really am. And I was like, I can do this. I can go there. And the first 30 minutes were wonderful. And then someone brought in their baby that was also born in October oh. and it was a baby girl and I lost it. Like I, I wasn't expecting it and I didn't know how I would react. And I just, I, wa- I got up and I walked out the door and I cried and I sat in the truck and cried. And I told her, I said, I'm so sorry, but I can't be here anymore. Yeah. And she was completely and un- she understood. She's like, I totally understand. She was like, thank you so much for coming anyways. And, um, you know, even beforehand, like I'd helped her out, like I'd given her Harrison's old crib and tons of clothes. And I, I gave her all of the diapers that we had. So, you know, I did I did a lot of things, you know, for her. So I, I was grateful that I at least did that beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of like not going to her baby shower at all, not giving her anything. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. I know you always want to be, ha- I always feel like I, I want my friends to know that if they get pregnant, I'm happy for them. I'm, I'm so happy for them. It still is a really touchy top t- topic for, mm-hmm. you know, us. Um, but I, I am always so happy for them because yeah, you want to yeah. support them. You want them to have their baby and yeah, I t- want them. I don't want them to experience what I exactly, did, exactly. You know? Yeah. I don't want to experience what I did, no. but I can't, I can't change <laughs> but you're like the, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so kind of along with that, um, what is something that you shouldn't say to somebody that has experienced a loss, a stillbirth like you have? For me personally, I had just kind of started my journey of my faith and everything last year. Mm -hmm. And it was still very new and fresh. So I wouldn't say that it's like rooted and You could tell me any Bible verse, that kind of thing. And I'm like all for it. Mm -hmm. But one thing that really, I guess kind of to, well, two things really, that was just like, it doesn't settle well with me is it's all in God's plan. And God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. (laughs) I know some people find comfort in those, but the reason why I don't like the first one is because I was like, well, So you mean to tell me that, like, to me, it doesn't paint a picture of someone that people should worship kind of thing. I'm like, why would you worship someone that's like, oh, I'm just going to like kill off a baby. You know what I mean? So that, that, uh, that to me, I'm just like, I don't, I don't believe it's God's plan. Yeah. You know, I, I believe that there are things that he can't even control and it, that's one of them. I, I do not think God can control death. You know, uh, he can probably, he can control what happens to your soul after. But in terms of death, I, I feel like that's just not something that he can control. That That's how I view it. Mm-hmm. Another one is, you know, the whole strongest battles and our toughest soldiers get the toughest battles. And I'm like, well, this is a really crappy battle. Can I not be a strong soldier then? Yeah. You know? I feel like that almost insinuates that I'm always going to have to be dealing with something tough. Yeah. And I'm never going to get a break, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, 
the other day I had, you know, my therapist asked me, he was like, you know, do you think the world's fair? I said, I don't think it's supposed to be fair. I think it's just supposed to be life and you work for what you want. Um, if you don't get it, it's either because you didn't work hard enough uh, or someone else, like say job promotion, someone else kind of slithered in underneath you and, you know, schmoozed a little bit more than what you did instead of doing hard work, they schmoozed or in terms of death, uh, death of, a uh, um, like, like in terms of losing a child or losing a family member to cancer or losing someone to an unexpected death, like car accident or anything that's not just old age, mm -hmm. it happens and there's nothing you can do to control it. So I, it's hard to say if it's actually fair or not, because I don't think anything is meant to be fair. Yeah, this like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think life is fair, but you, you know, <laughs> I, I agree with you that there is, we, we have physical bodies that, yeah. and there are forces that act on our physical bodies and <laughs> yeah. And there's, I mean, you get blown over by really strong winds. Like what makes you think you're mm -hmm. like, you're even strong. I mean, mother nature is stronger than you. So it's yeah. like, you know, if something is going to happen, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. You want to, but yeah. You want a time machine. You want that DeLorean and you want to go back and change it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, <laughs> I know, yeah. I, you know, you can, you can do a lot of what ifs and would yeah. love to, you know, go back and get induced sooner or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, no. Nope. Yeah. I've had a lot of those thoughts too. Yeah. But you can just go down that and you're like, no, it's a totally, yeah, I can't go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. world. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's just not worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So on the opposite side, is there something that has been comforting to you that somebody has said to you that you've appreciated? Um, that has not made you mad. <laughs> um, it's, it's really when I, um, am able to speak to other moms with loss. Um, one of the uh, girls that I've spoken to Erica, she was so sweet when, you know, I, I met her and, you know, she was just like, she pretty much validated everything I felt. And she did give me hope that even though, the pain will never go away. It does eventually get easier. There are days where you're going to have days that you can go by and maybe you didn't realize you didn't think of them. And then you go, Oh, and she said, but don't be hard on yourself because that's just your body giving you a chance to breathe hmm. because the grief, like again, like I said, the grief isn't going to go away. And sometimes your body just needs a break. You know, it needs a break from the sadness, from the depression, from the the constant what is that are always going in your head, mm -hmm. you know, and she I think she's next month, actually, she'll be 13 years out from her loss. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, it, that that's just how it's just how it is. You know, it, she still still grieves for her daughter and um, still thinks of her and, you know, yeah. That never leaves you. I like how um, you said that she basically validated how you were feeling. Yeah. She didn't brush she it did. away. She didn't try and make it better. No. She just said, yeah, probably it's pretty crappy, huh? <laughs> yeah. She said, I know exactly how you're feeling. You're probably feeling like you could have done something better. You probably blame yourself. You probably, um, you know, you're, you're, I know you're angry, but just know that it, it's, it's not your fault. And if there was something, you know, uh, even sooner that you would have mentioned, you know, um, I, I've had this conversation too with my husband, like, even if say the night before and I went and I said, I just don't feel right, but they would have checked her and said, everything's fine. You need to go home. And then what, I mean, the same scenario would have happened, Yeah, you know, because whether or not she, like how, like saying how long she was maybe in distress for or anything. I mean, nothing can tell you what would have happened had I gone to the hospital that morning, had I gone to the hospital the night prior, had I done this, had I done that, had I, had I, had I, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, that's pretty, that's really nice having <laughs> those kind of support people that they understand. Yeah. 
they understand. Yeah. At, at first, I was a little apprehensive to talk to people who have also had the loss. How come? I didn't want to bring people into my grief because I wasn't ready to acknowledge it yet. Mm -hmm. And because it's such a big thing to acknowledge, yes. to acknowledge your pain, to acknowledge the fact that you're going to be hurting the rest of your life. And it's like, I just want to go in a bubble, wake up the next day. And it's all fine. I don't need to worry about it. But it's not that. So then when I, you know, my husband did kind of push me to go out and start talking and talking to people. And I'm grateful that he gave me that push. Good. Speaking of your husband, how has he dealt with the loss of his, your daughter? I know he was really, really excited for her. He, um, I would have to say it in terms of grief, he probably has a little bit of a harder time than I do only because I rationalize it to this and I, yes, he loves my son, and even though it's his stepson, he loves him unconditionally as if it was his own, but that was his first biological baby. Yeah. And I feel like it's no different than if you were to lose your firstborn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I told him that, you know, in the beginning of the gr our grief, and I said, you know, I think of it all the time of how, how could you possibly be feeling right now? I, I mean, this was your first baby you know and I mean you could have 10 babies and lose the 11th one kind of thing and it's still terrible but the fact that it's like you know you're gonna have someone that you look at and you can see yourself in them mm -hmm. and someone like you got to be there for the pregnancy and you were excited to see them grow and I, I was like I told him I was like I can't I can't imagine how you feel because I mean, I, I just, I just don't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know what I would have done had I had a stillbirth with Harrison, you know, having the first baby and you're like, well, what happened? Like what? I mean, everything was fine. Like what happened then? But even still, I say that now, you know, but I still think of that. I, you know, I remind myself of it often because mm -hmm. I know it just, it has to, it, I know it's devastating for him. Yeah. Devastating. Yes. Yes, for sure. It would be really hard for me to imagine having lost my first, you know, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with you. Do you, how do you help him through that? I try to just listen to him mostly. I try to validate his feelings as much as I can. Um, I give him his space because I know he, he'll need it every now and then. I know that usually if he's in Vanessa's room, that usually he's, he's just trying to grieve and I just, I give him his space mm -hmm. and I, I don't, I don't say I want to leave him alone with his thoughts, but sometimes you just kind of, you're like, I just kind of need to be in here and not have someone come and talk to me. Mm -hmm. And so I try to do my best to respect that. That's really good. You do need some space to grieve. Um, mm -hmm. That was probably not, not all the space, but no. yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. Like you said, like Give an hour. I mean, give an hour, yeah. give an hour or two, and then and to relieve some of that pressure. So mm -hmm. any I'm wondering if you've had any any sort of type of realizations about life and death or any aha moments in the last four months since Manessa has passed away. So it's really been about it, it was a couple weeks ago. I just had this thought and it made me realize with. um the death of my friend's uh, father who passed from cancer. And, you know, I remember hugging her before she left to go see him for the last time. And I told her, I said, I know grief. I said, if you need to talk to me, I'm here. I was like, I will be here for you as much or as little as you need me. You know, I, I, I try to check up on her daily, if not every other day. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? You know, okay, that's totally okay. You know, I try to remind her, you know, make sure you stay busy. Not because to push it away, but so I believe in, you know, body motion stays in motion. And if you're grieving in motion, you, I feel like you recover just a little bit better. I also think that death is a subject not many people are very comfortable with dealing with. And it's because you can't fix it. You can't come up and say, I'm so sorry. Here's a Band-Aid. 
it's not a recipe that has gone wrong and you're like, no, it still tastes great. It's not baking that you burnt the cookies or you didn't add the eggs or you didn't add the milk. It's not something you can do over. There is nothing that you can do that is going to fix anything. You can't bring people back from the dead. You're not supposed to fix their grief. You're supposed to just be there with them. Yeah. It comes in waves. Sometimes the waves are extremely tall and they come so fast and the highs and lows are just so extreme. And sometimes it's like nothing, you know, it's an occasional wave here and there. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I thought of it kind of sad. Well, moving on to the next thing. But sometimes, you know, whether your friend's grieving or whether you're grieving with your friend, if it feels too much. I mean, it's okay to just float in it. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to feel like you need to paddle out of it. It's okay to float. And, and there's, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It, because that is going to be the only way you're going to be able to survive this. Yeah. I super love that analogy. I just have this beautiful picture of somebody just floating in these waves, these crazy yeah. waves sometimes, but mm-hmm. sometimes even it's if it's too. a hurricane around you and yeah. all you have to do is like, just, just float. It's going to be okay. Yeah. I know you're, I know you're going to feel like, you know, the water's at your chin and it's any moment going to go over your head, but it's, you know, if you're just, ex- I, I guess, you know, floating is just accepting how you feel, letting it be for yeah. that time. And then letting and then kind of just letting it go, letting the waves yeah. space out, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's really a beautiful analogy. I like that so, so much. I super love that. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is going to be so good. Um, <laughs> now, Caitlin, I know that um, we're recording here in February and the next couple of the next couple of um, months are going to be full of, you know, Easter and Mother's Day. And yeah, have you thought about how you're going to navigate that? I haven't really thought of it. I try to take it one day at a time. Um, I know Easter is definitely going to be hard. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what I'll do. Um, I know I I know I'll want to do something for her. So, you know, I've thought of maybe you know, donating to like charities or something like that. Um, but exactly what I want to do is still kind of up in the air. Okay. I, there are some times where I just kind of come out and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And I do it. Yeah. So I can make a whole plan and then all of a sudden I'm like, eh, nope, scratch that. Go do something yeah. else now. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes that's the way it goes. So yeah. Yeah. It, um, I always just, it's funny because um, we were given the advice when our son's first birthday was coming around, just like, don't plan anything. Sometimes you will have these huge plans and, and you'll be so overcome with grief that you won't be able to do anything about it. And, and mm-hmm. then you'll feel guilty about not doing what you wanted to do. And so mm-hmm. we just kind of gave ourselves a, a hall pass and, <laughs> and mm-hmm. we, we played it by ear and it, and it turned out great because of that. So I know. Yeah. Just Sometimes you feel like you're going to do something and sometimes you don't. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I like to do. I just kind of like to wing it. And yeah. Other times it's like, oh, well, you know, this is a crappy day. I'm going to buy some ice cream now. Yeah, so you're like, ice cream I'm going to I'm so. do that. <laughs> good <Yeah>. good work. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it so much better. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, any last advice that you would like to, to share with our listeners, whether, and, and keeping in mind that, um, there are lost moms and then also um, lost dads listening to this and then those who are supporting those lost parents. Um, any last piece of advice you'd like to give us? Yeah. So join any kind of support groups you can find. My husband has recently started. It's still very, very new. Um, he created a Facebook group. It's called Fathers of Lost Angels. And it's a place for men to go only men because so they can share their grief because the way he says it is and I, and I agree because men the way that they are that they want to fix things they want to be the strong one yeah. they want to mm-hmm. be the one who makes everything better and sometimes they feel like that they can't experience those raw emotions because if they fall apart 
then the wife will fall apart. The kids will fall apart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this journey of grief, my husband has discovered there's not a lot of resources for men out there. Yeah. And having that resource is super important. Yeah. I mean, women aren't the only ones that lose their child. Yeah. It's dads lose them too. Yeah. You know, there needs to be more advocacy and more voices and more groups for fathers or, you know, to join as well, whether it's just a men's group or, um, it, or, you know, couples one help too, but it, there are still even men who are like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go there because probably not a lot of men are going to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that is something that I definitely would encourage, you know, any father or um, mother listening to this right now. They're like, oh, I think that would be great for me or for them. Um, as for the friends, I mean, if you think of our baby, tell us, just, just tell us because it makes us so happy mm -hmm. to know that you're thinking like when my friend told me about her dream about Vanessa, it made me so happy, so happy to know that she, um, she had a dream about her and she wanted to share with me, you know, we've told our friends to share what they thought Vanessa would be like. And I remember at her wake after the funeral, um, it was something very unconventional. We had, we had food out, we had music playing, we had a bounce castle. I mean, it, we wanted it to be bright colors, fun, because we're not the sad, depressing people. We're like, we want to do something that we wanted people to come over and celebrate her life, even though it was so short. Yeah. And we, you know, we didn't want kids being there being like, Oh, you know, I'm so doom and gloom. We want people to stay and to share with us. And our friends would be like, yeah, I totally would have pictured Vanessa, you know, mimicking like Alfonso. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she, or she and her brother would get into all this mischievous stuff together, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, you know, we liked, we love hearing that. Yeah. So don't feel afraid to tell us because you're, you're not hurting us by sharing. And, you know, one thing that's really stuck with me is you're not reminding me that my child's dead. I know that I, I gave birth to her. Yeah. I, I gave, I mean, it, it sounds uh, kind of crazy, but I gave birth to death. I know firsthand so you don't have to worry about reminding me because I lived it. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Yes. Talking about our children. It is. Yeah. Tell us that you're thinking about yeah. our children. I think it's so, mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference. I, whenever I hear my son's, somebody says my son's name, I was like, oh yeah. He, mm -hmm. Yeah. You just, you, you light up like a parent would about your children. Mm -hmm. when you talk yeah. About we them. still love them. And you know, we, even though we can't talk about the milestones that they've done, we can talk about the things we've done in their honor. We can talk about, um, you know, the, the fun moments in the pregnancy, you know, whenever, uh, the typical, whenever the dad tries to put his hand on the belly and the baby stops kicking <laughs> all the time <laughs> because somehow it knows, <laughs> you know, we like to talk about fun things like that. We like to reminisce and yeah, we're going to cry. I mean, you can guarantee we're going to cry, Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Tears are okay. Yeah. Tears are definitely okay. <laughs> Caitlin, thank you. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed all you had to say today um, and the advice you gave, because I think it is very powerful. And I hope, <laughs> I hope people take a uh, a page from your your playbook here because um, thank you as very super helpful so thank you for the beautiful analogies as well I'm like really still thinking you, you just floating along in those ways <laughs> with a yeah. hurricane around you <laughs> yeah I mean if you want to picture yourself in one of those duck floaties just chilling there I mean do whatever you need to do I mean <laughs> yeah more power to you if you need your scuba gear and everything I mean Whatever you need to survive it, you, I mean, you you get that gear yeah. and you use it and mm -hmm. don't let anyone tell you any different because only you know how to navigate your grief, yeah. even when you don't know what you're doing. Yep. <laughs> Figure it out. Yeah, you totally do. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, well, that didn't work so much this time. Let's not do that. <laughs> oh, well, thank you again, Caitlin. This was delightful. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you letting me be on here. Thank you. For sure. Many, many thanks to Caitlin for being so open and honest and 
raw about her daughter Vanessa and her experience with grief and loss over these few short months. So thank you so much, Caitlin. Head over to our website, stillapartofus.com, where you can find the show notes, including a full transcript of this interview and any resources that were mentioned, where you can sign up for our short and helpful email newsletter, where you can learn how you can become a patron and support the work it takes to produce a show for just a few dollars a month, and lastly, where you can find out how to get in touch with us if you want to share your child's story on the show. The show was produced and edited by Winter and Lee Red. Thanks to Josh Woodward for letting us use his song, Vanishing Note. You can find him at joshwoodward.com. Lastly, subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. It's always darkest before the dawn, so if you're going to steal your neighbor's newspaper, that's the time to do it. Najot Singh Sidhu